This is 16 millimeter sound film. Because it's easily shown on small portable projectors, its invention has greatly increased the use and value of motion pictures. These days, anyone can operate a sound projector. The film is a celluloid strip perforated along one edge. A gelatin coating on one side contains the images of pictures and recorded sound. On black and white film, these images are formed of silver, and on color film, they are formed by dyes. Celluloid, unfortunately, is not the world's strongest material. Therefore, motion picture film must be handled with care to protect it from damage. You see what I mean? Let's take another example. Care must be taken to protect film in transit. Here's a strong fiber box, but see what's inside. If before we ship a reel of film, we apply a paper band and fasten it securely. At the other end of the line, we'll have film, not spaghetti. There are two types of celluloid used in the manufacture of film. One of them, known as cellulose nitrate, is the kind used for the 35 millimeter print shown in the movie theaters. Nitrate film is comparatively strong, but it has the disadvantage of being highly inflammable. It is almost an explosive. Theaters are required to maintain elaborate precautions against fire and to employ highly skilled operators. This is just one of many reasons why it would not be safe to use nitrate film in a portable projector. All 16 millimeter film is made of acetate cellulose. Acetate film is perfectly safe, but it's not as tough as nitrate. Any friction against the surface of moving film is likely to produce a scratch. It shows on the screen as a dark vertical line, like this, and this, and this. Hey there! Get your fingers off the film. That's better. The manufacturers of 16 millimeter projectors carefully design their machines to keep film wear and strain at a minimum. But in running through a projector, the film necessarily touches and rubs against parts of the machine. Here at the gate, for example, the film is pressed between two pieces of metal, the aperture plate and the pressure plate. But see how these plates are made. A wide path has been hollowed out for the pictures to go through. And another has been made for the soundtrack. The important areas of the film are not touched at all. Other parts of the machine, the guide rollers, sprockets, and the sound drum turn with the film. And so, there is no friction. In spite of the manufacturer's care, Scratches sometimes occur in the machine. Careless threading is one cause. Here, for example, the operator is allowing the film to scrape the bottom of the lamp house. See those guide rollers? That's what they're for. Film runs through the gate at the rate of 36 feet a minute. Dust and particles of gelatin are accumulating on the surfaces of the plates. Eventually, the hollowed out spaces are filled with dirt. And so, we have more of those lovely scratches. Before every reel of film, the wise operator uses a brush to clean out the gate. At regular intervals, he inspects the gate for hard particles of gelatin that the brush could not remove. He scrapes them off with a toothpick. He does not use a knife blade or a pin. 
a metal tool would spoil the polished surface of the plates. The operator also cleans the sprockets and checks the guide rollers to see that they turn freely. While we're talking about scratches, here's another way to make them. The film is wound too loosely on the reel. We think it ought to be tightened, so we grab the reel firmly and pull the film good and hard. This is called cinching the film, and the scratches we get are called cinch marks. They look like this. It's better to leave the film loose than to tighten it by cinching. The perforations along the edge of the film provide the means by which the sprocket wheels of the projector move the film. Here, the operator has been careful to mesh the film perforations with the sprocket teeth. But a bad splice in the film may cause the perforations to jump out of alignment with the teeth. And so, new holes may be punched where they don't belong. It's easy to check for this sort of damage while the machine is running. Gently feel the perforated edge of the film as it passes into the take-up reel. If the film is rough or jagged, stop the machine. Look for the source of trouble. The sprockets carry the film with a smooth, continuous motion. But at the gate is a set of claws which move in and out, up and down, to give the film an intermittent movement. Film is threaded so as to leave small loops above and below the gate. Loops act as shock absorbers, confining the intermittent movement to only a few inches of film. A few torn holes like these may travel safe sprockets. But at the gate, the claws fail to drive the film. The lower loop tightens, and on the screen we have a picture that looks like this. Without its shock absorber, the film is being strained. A few torn holes have grown to be a whole series of them. It's sometimes possible to reform a loop while the machine is running. However, it's better to stop the machine immediately. There will be less damage, and the operator has a chance to check all of the threading. One of the most useful parts of a projector is the loop wheel. Right to turn the machine right now. breaks into it can of course be repaired. The slice is really a well, so the trick in making slices is to have the overlapping surfaces absolutely clean. Roughing them lightly with a razor blade will help. And be sure that the cement you use is fresh. The projector is clean and well adjusted. The film is carefully threaded. With proper care, a 16 millimeter film will give hundreds of good showings. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams.
modern motion picture brings you romance, education, entertainment. It brings the world's best drama to the smallest town, the poorest man. Behind the glamour of Hollywood lies an industry, turning the wheels which bring these marvels to you. Creative artists and technicians put together the mixture of art and science which makes actors and sets, electricians and lights, cameramen and cameras. There is a roll of motion picture negative film in this camera. The finished picture will be on another roll, known as positive film. These delicate strips of film with their light sensitive coatings are the materials which record and transmit the creations of Hollywood to the world. This picture is the story of these films and of how the alchemist in Hollywood makes entertainment out of silver. These buildings are some of the movie photo finishers or motion picture laboratories in Hollywood. When you have taken a snapshot of Junior with your own camera, you take your roll of film to the photo finisher and next day see your finished pictures. This is just what happens to movie film from the studio camera. The photographic process and how it brings a picture to you is explained by this diagram originated by Dr. Mies. When you look at an object in real life, the brain at number one receives an image of it through the eye. In photography, the object, the large black X at two, is imaged by a lens on a light sensitive film at three. The exposure period produces a latent image on the film at four. After developing and fixing, a visible negative image is formed at five. It is called a negative image because it is white where the original object is black and vice versa. In order to obtain an image in which the light and dark areas are in the correct relationship, this process must be repeated. The negative is therefore photographed or printed. Light shines through the negative and falls upon another light sensitive film at six and produces a latent image at seven. Once more, the developing and fixing of the film reveal a permanent image at eight, which is this time a positive image of the original object. Therefore, when this positive image at nine is illuminated, the brain at 10 again sees an image which is a faithful reproduction of that obtained from the original subject. What happens to the film chemically may be expressed in three equations. First, a latent image is formed. Second, it is developed. And finally, made permanent. The photographic emulsion is made up of millions of tiny crystals of silver bromide suspended in a thin layer of gelatin. This picture shows how the crystals actually look when magnified several thousand times. We want to talk about them for a few minutes in rather technical language because on their peculiar properties is based the whole art of photography. You will note that the triangle is a typical shape in this group and for simplicity we shall talk about a single triangular crystal. This crystal is made up of a pattern of silver and bromin ions. The silver denoted by AG bear a positive charge and the bromin denoted by BR a negative. The significant detail about this crystal which makes it a photographic value is a tiny speck, S, known as the sensitivity speck, consisting primarily of silver sulfide. These specks are probably formed during the manufacture of the emulsion. Let us follow the action when light waves from your favorite movie star pass into the camera to the emulsion. A few light quanta strike this particular crystal and when a quantum of proper energy hits a bromin ion, it releases an electron from the bromin, leaving it no longer an ion, but an atom with zero charge. The electron is then free to travel within the crystal, just as if the crystal were an electric conductor. Indeed, we speak of this property of silver bromide crystals as photoconductance, since they conduct electricity when light falls on them. Electrons within the crystal travel freely, and naturally in their wanderings, they find the sensitivity speck. Since the molecular pattern of this speck is such that it can trap electrons, like a positive pole in the crystal, the electrons released by the action of the light find themselves clustered about the sensitivity speck. The accumulation of these electrons converts the speck to a negative pole capable of attracting positively charged particles. 
there is at all times within the crystal a movement of ions due to thermal agitation. Under ordinary conditions, the silver and Roman ions move sluggishly about, occupying vacant places within the crystal lattice. In this particular crystal, however, something has happened to disturb the normal state. After being struck by the light, a negative pole was formed at the sensitivity speck, and now positively charged silver ions are attracted to the speck. We follow the silver ions in their slow path toward the speck. Since their movement is due to thermal agitation of the molecules, this action is faster when the crystal is warm than when it is cold, which explains why film is less sensitive in cold weather. The silver ions are gradually drawn to the speck, and as fast as they come within its range, they are neutralized by the electrons clustered about the speck. Eventually, one atom of silver is neutralized at the speck for each quantum of light which hit the crystal, and the sensitivity speck finds itself surrounded by a group of silver atoms. It is the aggregate of these clusters of silver present in the crystals which were struck by light, which are the latent image in the film. This image is called latent because it is quite invisible and of no use to us until a developer reveals it. The latent image is permanent, this crystal pattern being stable at ordinary temperatures. In fact, film exposed by the Andre expedition and abandoned in the Arctic was found 30 years later and developed to give satisfactory pictures. Following the neutralization of the electrons at the speck by the silver ions, the speck regains its original ability to trap electrons, and on immersion in a developer, an ionized molecule of hydroquinone bearing a negative charge is attracted to the speck, or latent image. The secret of the use of certain reducing agents as developers is that their electric potential is of just the right order to be attracted to the specks, but they are not powerful enough to reduce the silver ions in neighboring crystals which have not been exposed to light. One molecule of hydroquinone appears at the speck and loses its negative charge, which is an electron, to the group. Thus negatively charged, the speck is once more the target for wandering silver ions. And as fast as one silver ion arrives at the speck, neutralizes itself, and leaves the group again positively charged, another molecule of hydroquinone appears and deposits another electron. If this keeps up long enough, all the silver ions within one crystal are reduced to metallic silver, and we have a black deposit forming part of a visible image. The bromide ions move out of the crystal and are released in the developer. To show how a picture of light and dark tones may result from a collection of silver particles, let us see what happens when crystals are given exposures of different intensity. This crystal, receiving much light, has many electrons released and many silver atoms formed. Following development, it is completely reduced to metallic silver. The next crystal, receiving a moderate amount of light, has fewer ions reduced to atoms and has some of the silver and bromin ions left in their places. The third crystal, receiving little light, has few electrons released and few silver atoms formed. Our three crystals then have this appearance. It is necessary to remove these undeveloped silver and bromine ions, and this is accomplished with sodium thiosulfate, which dissolves the silver bromide, leaving the metallic silver atoms behind. The deposit of silver, making up the visible image, actually consists of clusters of these atoms distributed throughout the gelatin layer. These particles are not evident in an actual picture, but may be seen under enormous magnification, as in this photomicrograph. We have seen how the silver bromide crystals receive and store the latent image, and learn that a developer is needed to reveal it, and a fixing bear to make it permanent. In a Hollywood laboratory, thousands of gallons of such developing solutions are in daily use. They are compounded with the utmost care, using purified water and tested chemicals, but what goes into a developer? First of all, we need a reducing agent, of which hydroquinone is typical. There are a number of organic reducing agents, such as elon, pyro, glycine, amidol, and hydroquinone, which will convert the latent image to metallic silver. Here we see some hydroquinone added to water and a piece of exposed film agitated in the solution.
but why doesn't it develop well the reason nothing happened is because the developer will work only in the presence of an alkali therefore we next add some sodium carbonate to the hydrogen on solution now observe that development takes place promptly but also observe that the solution becomes discolored the discoloration is due to the oxidation of the hydroquinone and a solution like this would lose strength very rapidly to prevent this rapid oxidation and loss of developing power sodium sulfite is included in the formula to a solution of hydroquinone we first add some sodium sulfite and then add the sodium carbonate A piece of exposed film when immersed in the solution will rapidly turn black, indicating that the developing power is unimpaired by the sodium sulfite. But now we notice that the solution remains perfectly colorless. Our developing solution is now practically complete. It is desirable, however, to include a small quantity of potassium bromide to restrain the reducing action of the developer so that it will convert only the desired image into metallic silver without affecting the surrounding unexposed silver bromide. The ability of potassium bromide to retard the action of a developer is illustrated here in an exaggerated way. Both flasks contain complete developing solutions. An excessive amount of potassium bromide has been added to the one on the left. Now we see that the solution with the excess bromide does not develop at all. These then are the ingredients of a developer. A, the developing or reducing agent. B, the preservative. C, the alkali or activator. D, the restrainer. In addition to a developer, we need a fixing bath containing sodium thiosulfate to remove the undeveloped silver bromide by converting it to soluble silver thiosulfate. The primary function of the fixing bath, therefore, is to remove the unexposed, undeveloped silver bromide. This action not only makes the film transparent where there is no image, it also makes the image permanent. Since the action of light by itself would gradually cause the unremoved silver bromide to darken. In this demonstration, we observe that a piece of undeveloped film becomes transparent when agitated in a strong solution of hypo because the silver bromide is converted to soluble silver thiosulfate. You will recall that development was carried out in an alkaline solution. It is therefore desirable to make the fixing bath acid in reaction so that development will stop promptly when the film is immersed in it. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. This film will present a digest of some basic research which explains how the use of well-selected 16 millimeter motion picture teaching films has improved instruction. These research studies explain how film experiences may help students learn increased amounts of new information which is remembered longer and which therefore may be applied efficiently to problem solving situations as pupils progress from lower to higher grades. Without doubt, some of the most effective teaching goes on in the primary grades. As the teacher begins instruction in reading, she knows that experiences and understandings must precede the printed word in its comprehension. She recognizes the axiom before the word, the idea, or reading readiness, then reading. Before the word, the idea, simply means that the child must first gain understandings about real things, concrete things. Later, the child can associate appropriate understandings with the words or phrases that stand for them. 
The teacher explains this process as we see, we learn, we read. This group is getting ready to read a simple story, and Johnny's teacher is explaining that before they read, they will leave the classroom to visit some of the places and things they will later read about in books. In the beginning, it is very easy to provide first-hand experiences, reading readiness experiences. The school neighborhood provides useful and interesting opportunities to see, to examine, and understand. Understandings they will later meet through words in books. Understandings are first gained by seeing things at first hand, watching, experiencing. These understandings will then be matched to words which stand for them. As practice continues in relating ideas to words, children soon learn to read, which in itself is little more than the process of matching new experience with appropriate words. Back in the classroom, the children make a discovery. These up and down lines, these circles and curves are really words. Words which stand for the things they saw and now know about. The children continue to practice matching understandings with words. And as this happens, the remarkable process of reading has begun. As reading continues, new and more difficult words are introduced. This creates a need for more and more first-hand experiencing. A need which will continue throughout the entire school experiences of these children. This becomes more complicated as the things we read about no longer can be witnessed in the schoolyard, in nearby parks, or out in the neighborhood. As second graders prepare to read about things which happen far away or are difficult to see in real life, the problem of providing readiness for such reading increases. It is at this point that the usefulness of the 16 millimeter sound motion picture teaching film dramatically reveals itself. The teaching film can be used to supply many desired experiences which should precede reading. In the film reading study conducted by the Harriet Gorman Committee, Dr. Paul Whitty and James Fitzwater, it was discovered that the use of the teaching film can help children learn to become better readers. This study measured the way in which the use of eight selected sound motion picture films influenced their reading. The reading of second grade children. In this study, it was revealed that 95% of the children showed improvement in reading. It continued to demonstrate that 95% of the children showed vocabulary improvement. That 70% were able to express more and better ideas during class discussion and that 99% of the group wanted to continue to learn to read the film experience way. When these findings were checked against the judgment of participating teachers, they reported, the children learned to read faster, class discussion improved, independent reading increased, and vocabulary, the key to success in reading, was increased. In the intermediate grades, the need for providing real experiences about things studied continues. Good teaching methods include the use of pictures, the chalkboard, models, and charts, usually before the learners turn to the pages of books for information. Some of the pupils can recall experiences of their own about pupas, larvae, and insects, and they can describe them to their classmates as they refer to charts like these. But for all the children in the classroom to really understand how things move and grow and develop from one stage to another, something else is needed. Something which can bring living experiences right into the classroom. Experiences that are as lifelike as reality itself. What would happen if sound motion picture films were added as study materials in this classroom? 
A study by V.C. Arnspeiger reveals the answer to this question. In an experiment in the use of films during the study of natural science, Arnspeiger worked with over 2,000 students. He found that film using groups were able to achieve gains, gains up to 30% above those possible by non-film using class groups. Continuing his study in the area of music, he discovered gains from 18 to 34% for seventh grade film using groups. Four weeks later, Arnspeiger measured the retention of film learned information. Science film group superiority ranged up to 18%. Music film groups retained up to 32% more information. The motion picture film does improve pupil achievement. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. My name is Charlie Wright. I'm going out with my new movie camera. Want to come along? The fellow who sold it to me said, just follow the instructions and you can't go wrong, Mr. Wright. <laughs> There's the house of my neighbor, Joe and Mabel Teitelhocker. It's a nice, typical suburban home with a baby, dog, cat, and mortgage. There's Joe Teitelhocker arriving home with a package. I wonder what's in it. I know it's not his anniversary. I've never seen Joe so excited. All right, so he ain't me. Why, it's a camera like mine. I knew he'd get one as soon as he saw the one I had, the copycat. Yep, the instruction sheet is just like mine. It tells you exactly how to use your camera. I'm telling you, Joe, you better read it. Don't be a schmo, Joe. Joe's taking his first movies of his wife and dog, Rover. Any resemblance between Rover and Joe is purely coincidental. Now, I'm anxious to see how his first attempt comes out. So is Joe, Mabel, and Rover. Here it comes, Joe's big moment. I'll bet Rover will think he's the new laughing. What's that? Oh, it's not focused correctly. It must be a picture of Mabel and Rover. I only know it because I saw him shoot it. Now let's leave Joe and his troubles for a minute and see if we can find the correct way to focus. On the front of the camera is a lens. There are two types of lenses, focusing and fixed focus. With the fixed focus lens, no adjustment is necessary as all objects are sharp, except those very near the camera. The focusing lens has to be adjusted. Estimate the distance between camera and object and set the calibrated ring accordingly. This scene is incorrectly focused. As the focusing ring is rotated to the correct position, the scene becomes sharp. Uh, there's our Joe again with his camera. I hope he's smart enough not to make the same mistake. Mrs. Teitelhocker sure looks like she's been busy. And so does the baby. Let's go back to Joe's living room and see how things look on the projection screen. I'll say this for Joe. He didn't make the same mistake twice. He overexposed. To obtain a good picture, the film must be correctly exposed. The lens is similar to the human eye. In the eye, there is an iris which expands and contracts to vary the amount of light reaching the retina. In the lens, there's a diaphragm, which also expands and contracts to vary the amount of light reaching the film. As the light increases, the diaphragm aperture must be made smaller. As the light decreases, the diaphragm aperture must be made larger. When the diaphragm aperture is correct, 
or the amount of light admitted, the scene is properly exposed. If the diaphragm is open too wide, the film becomes overexposed and is too light. If the diaphragm opening is too small, the film becomes underexposed and is too dark. Another point for the cameraman to consider is the direction of the sunlight. This statue has the sun shining on it from the front. The scene has no depth. It is usually more interesting to place the camera so that the sun lights the object from an angle. Now the statue has shadows in three dimensions. You know, cameras are wonderful. When Junior grows up, he can see a movie the first time he walks. And the first time Papa used his camera properly, I hope. You must hold the camera still, Joe. Uh, shall we dissolve to the projection screen? What happened? It seems Mrs. T has a backache and Junior's disappeared. Now, if Joe doesn't mind, the correct way. Compose the scene in the viewfinder carefully. Otherwise, you will lose part of the scene the way Joe likes to do. With the viewfinder, you select good angles. A common fault is to shoot from a straight-on position without considering perspective. The automobile and table appear uninteresting when photographed this way. The most pleasing way of seeing an object is from an angle. And when we see two or more sides, we get a feeling of depth. Now the table and automobile take on added interest. People also are more interesting when seen from the side or from above or from below. Well, there's just no stopping our hero. Now he's using a tripod. Ouch! Is there a doctor in the house? Come here, you, you, you. Sorry, censored. You can see who wears the brains in that family. Anyone should know better than to set up a tripod on a slippery surface. Mm -hmm. Anyone but Joe, I guess. Stop. You wouldn't kick a cameraman when he's down, would you? The correct way to set up a tripod is to adjust the legs to the proper height and place it on a non-slippery surface. You can see, obviously, that isn't Joe. The camera is screwed onto the tripod. The tripod then levels. The tripod should be set at the right tension. One hand grips the handle of the tripod, while the other firmly grips the base of the camera. This enables the camera to be rotated slowly and smoothly. This is called panning. If the panning is carried out correctly, the results appear like this. But if the pan is too fast, as in this scene, or too jerky, as in this scene, the results will be useless. But if the pan is smooth, impressive effects can be obtained, including tilting the camera slowly upward. Well, Joe has thrown a party for the neighborhood children. While the kids are having a good time, he's getting some excellent shots. I wonder how excellent. Let's see how it looks on the screen. There's a shot of Ann and Tony, and a shot of the Dugan sisters, and there's a shot of... Sorry, I can't keep up with it. Here's the scenes run at correct length. It's so simple, even a child could do it. But I forget you're not a child anymore, are you, Joe? Scenes should be run long enough to give the audience a chance to see and enjoy them. And if the scenes are assembled in an interesting order, there will be a greater feeling of continuity. Scenes should be at least 10 seconds. Well, here's our little genius again. And here are the results again. 
Hey, Joe, you should not have set the speed indicator at eight frames a second. You must set the speed indicator at 16 frames a second, which is normal for natural action. What a lovely scene. The kids have gone, Joe and his missus are relaxing. Why read that book, Joe? They didn't even have cameras in those days. Uh, do you mind if I look over your shoulder? Joe, you really fooled me. Just follow instructions and you'll take some real fine pictures and fool everyone. So long, Joe. Goodbye, folks. See you all in the movies. Hey, look, I'm back. You surprised? Did you miss me? Well, before I say goodbye, let's summarize what we've learned. Remember, always focus the lens to the correct distance. Set the diaphragm for the right exposure. Compose the scene carefully in the viewfinder. Pan slowly and smoothly. Keep the camera running long enough on each scene. Set the speed indicator at 16. Above all, study your instruction book again and again. And, oh yeah, by the way, goodbye again.